Hello, everybody. I am Brother Luke. Uh, welcome to this Wednesday night Bible study for the Church of the Eternally Secure, CES. Uh, get your Bibles out, and we'll start in a minute. Uh, we are in Philippians chapter 1, and we'll begin with verse 15 tonight. Uh, let's say hello to the, the congregation. Uh, Sister Renee. Hey there, beloved saints. Happy almost New Year. Uh, I did. I, I do want to say something before I forget. Uh, Annette uh, Sandrick wrote me and said that her dad is still not better and they're going to hospitalize him to please keep her father in prayer. I did a video about two weeks ago for him and now he's going to go in the hospital. So please keep Annette's dad in prayer. She asked me to ask you. And also, I'm sorry I'm not showing my face tonight. My eyes are very swollen, dry and puffy. Uh, so I, um, didn't want to put makeup on and make it worse, you know, make my eyes worse. So, uh, I'm going to hide my noggin and just do audio tonight. Okay. Thanks. All right. Maybe I should turn my camera off here because I, I don't want to feel like I'm on some kind of ego trip that I have to show my face and you guys are so, no, humble. You're so can... humble. You don't have to be seen. Oh no, that's not <laughs> Too vain to be seen. That's all. You you're so vain. You probably think this song is about you. I do. It's not. <laughs> okay. Oh, by the way, that's a Carly Simon song from before your time. I'm sure everybody. Uh, okay, brother Ben, say hello to everybody. Mm -hmm. Oh, great. Now you got me real curious and eager. <clears throat> um, okay, well, before we get started, uh, there's another prayer I want to bring to everybody's attention. Uh, um, Sister Victoria was in the hospital today because uh, her brother was in an automobile accident. So he's in the hospital now, and uh, he's was got some wounds from his car accident. I don't know how serious it is, but let's pray for him to have a complete and quick uh, healing. Uh, all right. Um, well, let me, one other thing I want to say is, is before we start is that um, uh, we could not do any of our programs, uh, really, if, if we didn't have the moderators in the chat room uh, being so helpful to us by um, you know, really uh, uh, being in charge and, and leading the, the, the chat room. And, and we, we have a, a published uh, chat room protocols or kind of rules uh, for uh, conduct uh, in the chat room. Uh, if you haven't read them, you should, everybody, I urge you to read them all. There's probably only like 10 or 12 points, uh, but we put them on the screen before we start every program. Uh, one of the one of the rules is that uh, I mean, being a moderator is a very very difficult responsibility. And um, uh, well, the last thing we want to do is when a moderator is doing their job, especially if they have to you know, correct someone or reprimand them or time them out or something, we don't want another moderator arguing with them and questioning them. So uh, if you think that any of the moderators are making a mistake. Uh, you know, in their duties as a moderator, uh, then that's something we need to talk about privately. So let, let's not have one moderator challenge another moderator uh, during the live program. Just let it go until until the program's over and we we can discuss it, uh, uh, you know, privately then. So so please uh, honor that. All right, I guess we that's all we need to say before we get started. Uh, um, I still think it's a good idea for us to um, have you guys read the verses so my voice doesn't give out. Uh, so let's start with verse 15. And uh, um, how do you want to do that? Uh, which of you uh, or want to take turns or something reading the verses? Fine. Okay, uh, go ahead and begin then. Verse 15, I think 15, 16, and 17 kind of go together, don't they? Yep. 
Okay. I will read the King James. Do you want me to go first on this or do you want to go first, Ben? I can read it. Some indeed preach Christ, even of envy and strife, and some also of goodwill. The one that preached Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds, but the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. I think that what Paul's saying is whether people are speaking uh, or preaching about Jesus and his death, burial and resurrection out of love for God or not, uh, that it's good that Jesus's name and message is being promoted, whether it's through people that hate him and hate Paul also and hope to get Paul in more trouble or whether it's those that really love Jesus. Um, either way, the message of the gospel is being preached. So um, because he says some indeed preach Christ, even of envy and strife and some also of goodwill. The one preach Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bond. So uh, whatever they're saying, uh, it's still being repeated. Like even if they uh, don't believe the gospel or these religious Pharisees or whatever, uh, and even the pagans that said that Paul was uh, putting down Diana, uh, their goddess, and keeping people from making a living, telling them not to buy idols, which was keeping them from making money and turning the people against him. The message of Jesus and his death, burial, and resurrection is being preached. And so either way, uh, Paul knows that God will use it uh, to save souls. It sounds to me that even though it, it, it looks like, because um, uh, if you look at the, the verse before, it says, and many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. So because he's in jail, uh, his enemies and the enemies of the gospel thought that it would shut the message up. But in reality, it's just giving boldness to people to preach the gospel openly, knowing that God has not forsaken them just because they're in jail. See, there's this worldly thinking that if you belong to God, that he won't let anything happen to you. And if you're really of God, you wouldn't, you know, that's why the, one of the reasons the Muslims deny Jesus died. Uh, so it, it's the same thing here. Uh, his his being put in jail was supposed to shut the message up. And uh, I believe that the message of Jesus is being pre preached by unbelievers hoping to add to Paul's affliction and out of uh, envy and strife. But it doesn't matter to Paul because the gospel in the name of Jesus is being preached. So either way, it's it's for good. Well, Ben, uh, I don't know if you noticed in the chat room, uh, there were several comments that your audio is not working. Uh, uh, I don't know if it's still an issue, but uh, it was. Oh, and Ben, I wanted to thank you. I got, I just uh, now looked at that, what you sent me. It is wonderful, beautiful. Uh, yeah, in in the chat room, if uh, if you can, if Ben is uh, audio is not working, let us know. Uh, I don't. It, yeah, I can hear you fine, but uh, the chat room couldn't. I don't know if it's still a problem, but it's someone in the chat room, uh, please make a comment. Let us know if Ben is coming in or not. It was breaking up. They could hear him, but it was breaking up. Mm hmm. I still, you know, uh, Twin Talk says still cannot hear Ben. Hendrick says can't hear Ben. So Ben, uh, I guess uh, until you can fix that, Nanny says you can't. She can't hear you. Uh, so uh, until you can figure that out, Ben, uh, let's not have you give your answer and and uh, if nobody can hear you, so work on that, and I'll go ahead and go next. Uh, uh, you know, the interesting thing about these, this portion of scripture, uh, you, you've heard me uh, mention uh, Bible Jim in the past. Uh, Bible Jim, Jim Weber is his name, and, and uh, Reuben Israel, they're, they're really probably the two of the most famous and biggest leaders of the 
uh, organization of street preachers in America. And uh, I got to know Bible Jim very well. He, he came to my house for our Bible study for five years. And uh, Reuben, has, when he comes to town to preach, he, he would has stayed at my house along with many other street preachers. Um, I, I, and Ben, I mean, um, uh, uh, Bible Jim, you know, he, he has a great gospel message. I mean, he, he, it's, he knows the gospel as, as well as any of us. Uh, and he would preach a real gospel, but most street preachers preach a works a works based system. And I, I I had a falling out with with uh, uh, Bible Jim. Um, I basically, I, I said I, most of the people that we're working with here, they're preaching, you know, repent of your sins and change your life, and, and they're, they're not really preaching the gospel at all. And Jim would say, well, at least they're doing something. I mean, how many Christians are out there doing anything? So uh, my my view on it was I, I said, well, yeah, they're doing something, but they're doing more harm than good because they're preaching a false gospel and their, their demeanor is so ugly that they're really uh, uh, turning people off. Uh, people are telling me that if that's what a Christian is, I never want to be one. But Jim went to these, these scriptures here to support his position to, that well, at least they're doing something as Paul is saying here, uh, uh, he's, he, these, these scriptures are, I don't think they're intended for that. Uh, if a person is, if a person is, let's say, okay, their motives are bad. Maybe it's, it's ambition, uh, or, you know, they're not even sincere, but it's good as long as they're preaching Christ and the gospel. But I don't think Paul would say, Hey, it's, it's okay. We still appreciate what they're doing. If they're preaching a false gospel. So let me read it in the Amplified in 15, 16, and 17 here. It says, some, it is true, are actually preaching Christ out of envy and rivalry toward me for no better reason than a competitive spirit or misguided ambition, but others out of goodwill and a loyal spirit toward me. The, the latter preach Christ out of love because they know that I have been put here by God on purpose for the defense of the gospel. Okay, uh, that, is that it? Six to 16, or did we finish on 16? Seven, no, 17. 17. So, so 17 says, but the former preach Christ insincerely out of selfish ambition, just self-promotion, thinking that they are causing me distress in my imprisonment. So he's going to go on to, to say it's still good. It's, it's still good in spite of that. But but that that should not be used to say that it's okay. If they're preaching a false gospel, but no, at, least they're, at least they're doing something. No, this, this is saying that the message is clear. The gospel is being preached and Jesus, his name is being in love. People didn't know who Jesus Christ was in the first century all over the world. So his name being preached was a good thing. No, this would definitely not support a false gospel message like your friend put, because that's more harm than good. It's it's harder to undo a false gospel message than it is to get them the right one right off the bat. Is Ben good? Did he get his thing? Can you hear Ben, you guys? Please tell us that you can hear. Go ahead, Ben. Yeah. Still no audio. Still no audio. We can't, we can't hear you, Ben. I don't want to get lost. Did you sign out and sign back in? Yeah. Uh, ben, if you want to call me on the phone, I could put you on speaker and uh, play your voice through through my, my connection.
Ben, we want you to join us. They, it works well. I've done a lot of programs where people call into my phone and I put them on speaker. It'll work. Oh, okay. Well, all you got to do is talk on your phone. Turn your, connect your phone. Okay. All right. Let's go. Let's continue on then and let us know if you're able to continue or not. Um, all right, Renee, uh, let's go to the next verse. Uh, let me see. We did uh, through 17. So read verse 18, please, Renee. Okay. I'm really bummed about Ben because I missed him when he's not. Okay. Um, what then? Notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense, there's, there's the key, Brother Luke, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. Yet yeah, whether they're doing it, you're right, Brother Luke, clearly, with ulterior motives, or they truly want to preach for preach Christ crucified, either way, Paul's going to rejoice, because the message of Jesus is being preached. Yes. Okay. Uh, let me read that in the Amplify, and then let me see verse uh, uh, eighteen. Or is is it? Yes, eighteen. Um, what then does it matter? So long as in every way, whether in pretense for self promotion, or in all honesty to spread the truth, Christ is being preached. And in this, I rejoice. So, yeah, the, 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 Paul, I think, is really making the distinction that I was making. That, uh, yeah, if someone's preached out there because they're, let's say, let's say that they're just trying to get attention for themselves. That's their real motivation. Like the, like the, the, the people that are praying publicly and Jesus says, well, that they got their reward now, you know, but go pray in private and you'll have your reward in heaven. So if it's if you're doing it for your own glory or whatever, your motivations are all wrong. As long as you're preaching the real gospel, then then Paul would still be, you know, endorse it and be pleased. And we I guess I guess we should be pleased, even if someone's motives are, are bad. But uh, it's got to be the real gospel. It, uh, it, it says to spread the truth in the Amplified. Let me see that in the. Uh, KJV says, yeah, it says the truth. What then, notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth? Yeah, no, that that's talking about truth being uh, there. I think their sincerity. Done. Yes, yes. Pretense or insincerity. That's exactly yeah. what it means. Yeah. I'm ready to give it another shot if. Uh, yeah. Okay. Go, go ahead and, and we'll uh, ask the, the chat room to, to give us the feedback. I can hear you fine, but they they haven't been able to hear you. They say okay. it's I'm gonna, muffled in low volume. It takes 30 seconds, he said, we're behind. So I'm going to ask the chat room now. After you hear my voice, Ben's going to be talking. Let me know if you can hear him. Mm-hmm. Okay. okay, we'll we'll give it we'll give it a shot. Well, uh, if you recall from last week, uh, we're still on, I'm I'm commenting on verses 15 through 17. Uh, is that where we left off? No, we just read 18 also. Okay, I'll I'll do that. Hey, I'll come they, with... can you. they can. Yep. Okay, so 15 verses 15 through 17. Um, the you know when we read last week, if we recall. Uh, in verses 1 through 14, which we covered last week, Paul was praising the Philippians for supporting him in the defense of the gospel and being, uh, you know, in fellowship and partakers of the gospel. And so he was praising them for supporting him when no other church had. And they were praise, they were supporting him both financially and uh, uh, spiritually through prayer and whatnot. Um, and yet... Uh, Paul is now kind of call, calling a distinction and saying, and he's going to develop this later on in the epistle. And the reason I want to call this out now, because there's some kind of puzzling verses, I think, especially in chapter three. Uh, but I think he's kind of laying out what the, he's kind of laying the groundwork uh, for uh, those verses in chapter three here. And what he's saying is that there, there are, like you guys said uh, so well already, that there are some people who preach uh, Christ um, selfishly. 
he he preaches selflessly even in prison he's still uh, preaching and likewise the supporters of him this this Philippian church were also supporting him and Christ selflessly um and again they 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 were doing it from a, from pure motives like they, again they were they was they were doing it selflessly where uh these other individuals um were doing it through selfish ambition selfishly um and again that's what the law does the law uh whenever you think of selfish you know that's what the law does it's all self-centered whereas grace is uh uh selfless and the they the, apparently these these people I, like you guys said I, I believe they were teaching a true gospel but they did they probably didn't believe it themselves uh they could have but uh, it doesn't quite say although i think it, uh, as you'll see that i think it, it suggests they were unbelievers they were doing it simply to uh because they were jealous of paul i believe because it says he wanted they, they were supposing to add afflictions to his chains again i'm, I'm referencing the new king james um be, again, they wanted to basically kind of rub it in his face a little bit. I think to say, "Ah, oh, I see you're chained up here, but so we're taking over." They they saw it as an opportunity um, to take advantage of his uh, imprisonment, and I believe because they these believers supporting him financially, these selfish people. Uh, I believe I believe they were Judaizers essentially, but they probably kept their doctrine to themselves uh, at least at, at this point. And I'll, I'll go into that why I blew that here in a second, is because uh, I, again I think they, they were hoping that okay well since Paul's in prison uh, the, uh, his this church will now support us uh, financially um, uh, and so it also they were also looking probably to draw away disciples from themselves uh, and I, there's a couple a lot of connections I've made to, to come to that conclusion um, the. Um, Again, they, they, I believe they were trying to uh, gain a, a uh, draw away disciples from themselves because later in Paul, Philippians three two, Paul says, Be, "Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, evil workers, beware of the mutilation." And the mutilation is a, a euphemism or a, a um, uh, what they call it, pejorative for the uh, circumcision. Essentially, uh, those who uh, have trust in their those who walk by sight and are uh, have trust in their flesh, and they're, they believe in their, their, their self righteous essentially. Um, because I reason I say that is because uh, there, there's another, um, and also in Philippians, um, it says previously in Philippians one, uh, chapter one verse seven through eight, which we read previously. Uh, that verse that really caught me off guard, where where it said in New King James, I'm sorry, in the King James, in verse eight, it said that, um, well, in the New King James, it says, "For God is my witness, how greatly I long for all, you all with with the affection of Jesus Christ." Whereas in the uh, King James, it says, "The bowels of Jesus Christ." That really threw me off. But the bowels, essentially, uh, again, it means affection, like uh, uh, Paul. Uh, sorry, like uh, Luke said last week, it essentially means affection. Uh, but uh, that wasn't familiar to me. Um, so, again, they, 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 uh, Paul longed through the, uh, for these Philippians with, with, and it had great affection for them. And it used the word bowels. Well, later in Philippians, verse, uh, uh, later in Philippians, uh, chapter 3, verse 17 through 19, he says, uh, brethren, join in me, join in following my example and note those who so walk as you have for us a pattern. For many walk of whom I've told you, told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. And it says when they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, those those are words that are, are in italics, which means the, the uh, uh, translators inserted those uh, to try to make it more readable. And that very well could be that they were enemies of the cross of Christ in terms of uh, in their current walk, or in terms of their, you know, current state, they, they you know, they might have fallen from grace, uh, or they were lack, or walking inconsistent with Jesus Christ. They could have been believers at some point, or unbelievers. But either way, they were not walking consistently. Like they weren't walking uh, in accordance with Paul's example. Selfishly, they were walking selfishly, and he warns them that uh, even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ 
whose end is destruction, which could just mean ruin. Um, and, and you know, obviously, if they're unbelievers, their destruction is in hell. But if it's if they were believers at some point, their end is ruin in terms of rewards and, and potentially even being uh, temporarily uh, taken home early. But it says their God is their belly. And, and that word belly is, is equivalent to, I think it's a parallel to the uh, uh, the affection or, or the, the affection or the bowels of Christ. So Paul loved these Philippians uh, in the affection or the bowels of Christ. So that he had the love of Christ for them where these people, Paul's warning them about, their affection uh, or their God was their belly. And it says whose glory is their shame who set their mind on earthly things. So again, whether or not they were Judaizers or believers that were just very carnal, uh, again, they uh, they are going to be experience um, temporal chastisement, I believe. Uh, so I, th- I thought that was very interesting. Uh, and Paul said he said that even weeping, whereas, you know, and that's consistent with uh, Acts 20, uh, 28, 31, where he says, therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For this I know, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you. That strongly suggests to me that those were, they are unbelievers, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples for themselves. Therefore watch and remember that for three years... I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. So again, uh, I, I like to make connections like that. I like to compare scripture with scripture and draw uh, it, it better informs their interpretation. We see, again, here, Paul's talking about savage wolves, uh, warning them with tears. He does the same thing in Philippians. Um, and again, the, the whole concept of God is their belly or the bowels of Christ. It's, it's an area of affection. And so I just wanted to support uh, that conclusion that... Uh, well, I think it's interesting, and I think it's uh, help. It's very helpful for interpretive purposes. Whenever you see something about you know the the belly or uh, the bowels, uh, it kind of it kind of speaks to uh, one's motivation, um, where their authority is, what 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 their um, what's driving them. Um, so that's oh, and then eight verse eighteen. I'm sorry. Um, okay, so it, yeah, so it says. Uh, Paul says in verse 18, What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. And in this I rejoice. Yes, I will rejoice. Well, um, it's really interesting here because, again, one of the themes that we've seen over and over, I think, so far in this epistle is, uh, well, first of all, uh, Paul's confidence. So you see the word confidence used many uh, many times. And then you also see um, that... uh, that, that uh, Paul's confidence that no matter what, Paul's always confident that God's purpose and design is going to be fulfilled. Even if it's negative consequences for him, he knows that God always uses good, uh, or sorry, he uses evil for good, persecution for furthering the gospel. And so he rejoices in that. Um, so he's, he's always confident uh, of God's purposes. He always has that in mind, even though that his, his, con- his, his uh, circumstances might not be ideal. Uh, he knows it's, it's for the greater good, and he not, is not only confident of that, but because he's confident of that, he rejoices. So you'll see uh, throughout this epistle, or what we read so far, several words uh, pertaining to confidence and several words rec- uh, pertaining to, to joy and rejoicing. Um, and so I think that's a, a good lesson for us all. I'll stop there for now. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think that uh, when we did the first study on Philippians, uh, 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 when we're doing like an introduction to what the book's about, really that is the main point of this whole book is to show us that uh, we should maintain our joy no matter what the circumstances. And Paul is an example of that for us. Uh, Okay, uh, Renee, uh, why don't you read uh, 19 and 20 and and give us your thoughts. All right. For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, 
but that with all boldness as always. So now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. Do I give that to Ben to answer you or what? Uh, what you go ahead, Renee. I, I spoke for it. I spoke at length. So, okay. Uh, okay. Oh, now this is a great example of the word salvation. Uh, you guys in the chat, this is kind of important because a lot of false teachers or people maybe that just don't understand scripture can get hung up on words like salvation, and they only think it has one context the eternal salvation of the soul. And that is not true. Salvation simply means to be saved from. So in this instance, Paul, I believe, is speaking about he's confident uh, that through their prayers, he'll be saved from this imprisonment. I, I believe he believes he's going to be uh, delivered in some way. For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer. So it sounds like he believes their prayers will have him delivered. But he continues, either way, Jesus Christ will be glorified and lifted up, whether Paul dies for his namesake or lives and continues to live and preach and serve the Lord. Either way. No matter what, he's fine and he's at peace with it. And nothing he goes shoot through will make him ashamed. You know, people think, oh, oh, he's a jailbird. He's an ex-con. Paul said, I'm not ashamed. I'm in here for the cause of Christ. And he, he's not going to be ashamed because as long as the Lord is being lifted up, Paul knows this is all in God's hands and that whether he lives and the, and the next verse is famous proving this. Uh, that Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. So I believe uh, the salvation here is clearly not eternal salvation. He, he's not saying that their prayers are going to definitely give him eternal salvation. You can't pray for somebody uh, and they get saved because of it. You can pray for them that God open their eyes and they hear the gospel and they be saved. Yes, that's important. We should do that. But I don't believe that's what Paul's saying here, that I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer. I believe the salvation here is deliverance. But either way, whether he lives and gets to continue to preach and travel and preach the gospel, or if he dies, uh, either way, he's going to be fine because uh, and will not be ashamed because Jesus Christ is glorified. Lift it up. Mm -hmm. well, amen, sister. Uh I was real happy that you talked about the word salvation there. Uh, ben, why don't you go? Okay. Um, so verse 19 where he says, um, I'm sorry, we, we did 19 and 20 or did we go to 21? 19 and 20. Okay. So in in verse 19, he's again, he says, um, <clears throat> for this I know, again, he's expressing confidence. For this I know that, that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer and supply of the Holy Spirit. And again, I would just say, notice again, the theme of Paul's great joy because of his trust and confidence in God and his work through himself and the Philippian church, uh, despite extreme adversity, um, even Paul being in prison, because again, he understands how God uses evil for good. And I, I think this theme is already, uh, already evident and established in prior verses up to this point. So for example, in verse four, he says, always, oh, in every prayer of mine, making requests for you with all joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident confident of this very thing that he has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. And then verse 14, he says, and, and the most of the brethren in the Lord having become confident in my chains. So again, confident because of, of persecution. They, uh, again, they... We we I, I think I believe we should consider it a privilege and an honor. To, I certainly would to to know that you're being cursed and persecuted for the cause of Christ. Um, I, I actually personally welcome that uh, to, to be to be so to be to be to be deemed worthy of that. Um, and then again, like we said, we we read in verse eighteen where he says, uh, even 
uh, you know, even if they're t these people uh, have are preaching Christ out of selfish ambition, as long as it's not a false gospel. And again, they might not even pre preaching the gospel per se. They they could have been just saying, uh, you know, Jesus is the Son of God. They might not even, even they might not even again they might not even were preaching the gospel per se. They were just saying platitudes about Christ um, for the sake of uh, gaining disciples and uh, uh, support, financial support from from uh, his church. Uh, but when it came to mind with that, you know, when Paul said whether they do it uh, out of pure impure motives, it kind of reminded you of Luke nine verses uh, forty nine through fifty, where where uh, Jesus' disciple says, uh, "Now John answered and said, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we forbade him because he does not follow with us." But Jesus said to him, "Do not forbid him, for he who is not against us uh, is on our side." So again, as long as even if they're not, you know, in fellowship with with uh, fellow be other believers or partaking of the same ministry, as long as they're not uh, preaching error, um, they're not necessarily against you. Um, but again, I wouldn't necessarily support them either uh, if they if they if, if I knew they're doing it uh, out of selfish uh, means. Um, but so verse twenty, uh, like you said, with with regards to deliverance. Um, I, I, I believe Paul is essentially thinking of it in two ways. Um, one is uh, deliverance from prison, but also I think he considers, um, as he, in the next few verses, is kind of going to hint at, that even if he were to die, it would be gain to him. So in that sense, it's deliverance as well, because either way, he, he either way, God gets the glory, and he it's gained for Paul. So if he continues to stay in prison and is persecuted, he knows God's going to use it for the furtherance of the gospel. If he finds that he's uh, 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 is killed, well, then to die, uh, to live, to live is for Christ, but to die is to gain. So I think he uh, kind of thought of it both ways, and I think he's probably torn between the two. Two, he he kind of considered both good, um, and so he didn't really know which one was better. Uh, you know, either way, he he trusted in God to to. Uh, do the right thing or do do the thing that was is going to uh, further the gospel and be uh, a blessing to to his church. Mm, yeah, amen. <clears throat> uh, the uh, there are certain words in the Bible that uh, are really abused. Um, I have a playlist. I think it's titled "Words Have Meanings." And uh, and I think that we have maybe four or five words that that were selected to show that look these words are very important and it's important that you get get this right because uh, if you misapply these words uh, then you you're, you can twist the scripture so badly that we have a different gospel uh, uh, baptize uh, saved. Um, uh, Mm, repent forgot there's a couple more but this is another one is a salvation or or uh, saved in this case uh, he says he used the word salvation but I agree with Renee and, and Ben that this salvation is not talking about salvation from uh, the condemnation and the second death this is this is the salvation being saved from this particular, situation he finds himself in he's in prison and uh we know that eventually that ends up with his death uh he he is executed he's beheaded um uh and i think that uh i don't remember which epistle it was I, maybe it's um, second timothy uh is this last one where uh, where he's saying that he was he's going to be spared the lion's mouth uh, because as a Roman citizen, uh, the execution will be beheading. Because beheading is is uh, considered a merciful execution. It's instantaneous. I guess it would be painless because uh, it's so quick. Um, rather than being thrown to the wild animals and let them slowly eat you alive, uh, the way that many others have to suffer with, through their death, he he's thankful that that. Uh, he's going to have this quick death. Um, so these are the things, but 
that that word salvation i mean there are people when they see the word salvation they're going to try to apply this towards you know salvation and, and eternal life uh and the gospel and they'll twist it around and come up with a different a works-based system uh as renee said that somehow if if people pray for you that you can be get salvation and there are churches there are religions uh, mormonism does that i believe uh the Roman Catholics do that. I've had a lot of Roman Catholics say to me, well, someone they know died and they're going to pray for them. I said, well, why are you praying for them? If they're dead, it's already decided. It's already settled what, what their fate is. And uh, But no, they think if they pray for them, they can get them out of purgatory, you know. Um, so it's important we get uh, the word salvation or saved. Sometimes it's saved from uh, some kind of a hardship. Uh, I'm going to read it. Let me 19 and 20. Let me read it in the Amplified and see how it expresses it. Um, it says, uh, for I know with confidence that this will turn out for my deliverance and spiritual well-being uh, through your prayers and the superabundant supply of the spirit of Jesus Christ which upholds me. Uh, it is my own eager expectation and hope that looking toward the future, I will not disgrace myself nor be ashamed in anything, but that with courage and the utmost freedom of speech, even now as always, Christ will be magnified and exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. Uh, so he's... Um, I, I think he's also asking for prayers that he will be have the strength to stand up and not let the the torture or the imprisonment or anything uh, make him weaken. Not not his faith necessarily, but his stand. Because there were a lot of people that actually um, recanted their faith as they were being tortured. Um, it's a, there's a long history of uh, the the true believers being tortured by uh, the the Roman Church and and um, they uh, they were given an opportunity to recant, and then they wouldn't be burned at the stake or wouldn't have these horrible tortures applied to them. So I, I think this is what Paul's thinking here. Is he, he's, he's praying and hoping that he's with confident that he will be uh, spiritually strong enough. And that's why when it says in verse um, 19 about the Spirit, it says, it says for I know that, this shall turn my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Well, he's he's already got the baptism of the Spirit. When he believed, the Spirit entered him, uh, and he was regenerated, uh, born again. And he's already got the uh, um, indwelling and the sealing of the Spirit, where the Spirit of God will live in him forever. So why, why is he praying for the, the supply of the Spirit? Well, this is, this is what we call the filling of the Spirit. And that's where we ask that the Spirit of God give us power and strength. So um, that's what he's asking for here with his prayer. Yeah, uh, Pentecostals makes that up, uh, Brother Luke. They think the evidence of speaking in tongues proves somebody saved. And that's where they're wrong. There's a difference between the indwelling of the Spirit and gifts of the Spirit manifested and the bible's clear that not every person has the gift of speaking other languages or speaking in tongues uh it's clear it says does everyone have the gift of tongues does everyone heal it, it's a hypothetical question by paul and if everyone had the gift of tongues they twist the verse that says and they shall speak in tongues you know and this this will be the evidence they are mine they shall speak in tongues and all these things were manifest on pentecost it was a pro prophecy about the day of Pentecost, and they, they misuse it, twist it up, and say you have to have evidence. And this is the difference. I'm glad you mentioned the difference between the indwelling of the Spirit and being filled with the power. Because Paul also says, do not quench or extinguish the Holy Spirit, the fire in you for the Lord. So, um, yeah, that's an important distinction. And Brother Ben uh, said something about, you know, he didn't think it was about teaching an error either. And I, I think there's there's no way, like your friend, uh, Brother Luke, that you said, said, well, they're teaching error, but at least they're doing something. No, that's not, that, that verse cannot support that. Uh, it's clear. Paul says that when he was talking about Hymenaeus and Philetus, that their word 
doth eat as a canker. So it, it's there's no way that would be supportive of a, a wrong teaching. It's just like Ben pointed out, the name of Jesus was being preached everywhere. Jesus was being brought up. His name was being uh, uh, made famous throughout the world. So, and that and that's a good thing. Uh, but yeah, that was great stuff both of you just said. All right, thank you. Uh, all right, Ben, do you want to say more about that or do you want to go to the next verse? Uh, well, I don't think I'd comment is um, when you said about uh, the word saved, you know, it's very contextualized. It basically means delivered and saved. If you just add the word delivered, the context will tell you uh, what you're delivered from and delivered to. So it, salvation or deliverance in the Bible basically ca uh, uh, encapsulates uh, the idea that you're being saved from some kind of danger or harm and mm. uh, and brought to some place of safety or peace, you know. So it, it, the context determines what you're being saved from or delivered from and uh, where you're being delivered to. Uh, and I had a, I actually had a debate with a, a a friend of mine that claims to be a believer, but um, and I, I, he, I mean, I, I believe that he believes the Bible, but he doesn't understand the gospel. And he, he was saying that, no, there's no, there's absolutely no distinction between justification and salvation in the Bible. And I said, well, how about uh, first, how about second Timothy, or, I'm sorry, first Timothy 2.15, where it says, nevertheless, she will be saved in childbearing if they continue in the faith, love, holiness, self-control. So is, I, are you now going to prepare to say that women can only be saved if they, if they give birth? I mean, he was basically saying that, no, justification equals salvation. Salvation equals justification. Uh, and, he, of course, he had no answer for that. But, uh, yeah, I think that's a very important distinction. All right, thank you. All right, Ben, why don't you uh, read verse 21, one of the best verses in the whole Bible. So go ahead and give us your thoughts on that, Ben. Okay. Uh, for me to live is Christ. Oops, let me read it in the KJV. For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Um, so I, you know, I think Paul's basically saying, you know, that anything that uh, any life that he has um, is is wrought through the Holy Spirit. And when I mean life, I mean anything that's worthwhile, anything that has any enduring value in his earthly existence, um, is 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 done to magnify Christ. That's his goal, and that that that's his aim. Um, cause as we said in the previous verse that he, he is always confident that, uh, again, his earnest expectation and hope, again, there's that word confidence again, essentially the idea of confidence that Christ will be magnified in his body. Um, cause because he's yielding to the Holy Spirit and to the, uh, God's will, he knows that this will be the case, whether, whether it brings life or death, uh, physical life or death in him, but for him, any life that he does live, um, uh, it is for Christ. In fact, um, I think in, in some sense as well that he even considers his life to be the very person of Christ in the, in the sense that he's um, he is uh, a, a, a co-crucified with Christ, co-buried, co-risen with Christ. He's living by that resurrection power. And again, his identity is now inextricably linked with, with Christ. Um it, just like Christ said, you know, uh, you know, and and I think it's Matthew twenty five. He says, you know, he uh, who did did it did it to the least of these did it did it also to me. You know, and so in, in that sense, and also too, a, a parallel passage is Galatians two twenty, where he says, "I have been crucified with Christ. It is no no longer I who live, uh, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave him, himself for me." So in that sense, I believe that's how uh, he is, uh, by living, uh, he is now in Christ. Um, and so I believe, I believe essentially that he knows that even if he's uh, executed, he will be uh, instantly with the Lord. Um, and I, I think, he's, again, he's conflicted by the, the prospect of, okay, well, if I die, uh, I will be with the Lord, bonus. Uh, and if I, if I, I don't die, well then the, the, the I, I, more souls will be written one for Christ. So uh, either way, he, it's a win-win situation. 
Uh, and that's why he's rejoicing. That's why he's confident. Um, so, uh, that's what I would have for that verse. Okay. All right. Thank you. Renee, what do you say about that verse? It, it's short, but what do you, profound, isn't it? Well, it's one of the most famous verses. It's on coffee mugs and everything else that you're talking about. For me to live as Christ, to die is gain. Hold on one mm -hmm. second. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, there are songs from it. And yeah, either way, his, everything he does is in service of the Lord. Uh, and if he, if he gets out of prison, and he'll just continue to serve the Lord. So whether I'm alive, I don't live for me anyway. Paul's like, I, I have no uh, personal motivations like for my life to continue. Like there's no dreams that he didn't achieve or something because he lives in it, his life is Christ. Everything he does is Jesus. It, it's for him. It's to serve him. And to die is gain. Uh, and I think uh, this kill soul sleep i've heard people try to uh twist that verse up no it says uh you know i don't know if it's right, better for me to be absent from the body and to be present with the lord it doesn't say to be present i'm like come on y'all are really stretching here trying to make soul sleep work because he's saying he, he thinks it's better to depart to be absent from his body and to be present with the lord so there's no doubt that when he dies, he's going to be with Jesus. And we see Moses and Elijah on the Mount of Transfiguration. They weren't asleep. They had died already, but they're standing there talking with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. They were clearly alive. So um, I think it, there's a lot in that short verse that no matter what Paul says, that whatever God's will is, I win. And, that, and that's how I feel. I win. You want to kill me? I win. It's like, I, I, you can't, the worst thing you can do to me is send me home. That's it. You know, so that is a, a joy and peace that all Christians should have. We, we shouldn't fear what this wicked world does. God will give us the strength daily to endure, to live is Christ. And if not, to die is game. That should be all our attitudes. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, when we understand that and really believe it, then uh, it does give us that that peace that passes under all understanding. Uh, I, I've said this verse many times. I'm sure many of us have, have uh, um, spoken the verse, repeated it, and meditated on it and and relied on it I, I i'm relying on that i believe i believe it and i'm counting on it uh but uh, let me read it in the uh, amplified 21 says for to me to live is christ that is he is my source of joy my reason to live and to die is gain uh, for i will be with him in eternity um I don't know if he, he, he it's, it's right here where he continues and talks about it's uh, he's torn between the two and and uh, but uh, uh, I, I think we should all uh, understand that uh, it's actually better. I mean, Paul gives us this. Okay, either way is fine. If if the, if I'm going to continue living, then I'll serve him. Uh, my life will be focused on him. I'll be serving him, and and uh, uh, that's good. Uh, or if I die, then I'll be with him. That's good. But I would say that to, to die and be with him in eternity, that would be better. It's, it's actually much better, even though a lot of times we don't want to give up. If we are if we have some happiness and joy in this life with friends and family and the good things in life that we were, uh, where we, we rejoice and say, hey, it's good to be alive. Um, we probably uh, think that's pretty wonderful. But remember, in Revelation, it, it, it says um, something like, um, uh, no uh, uh, eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived or imagined the good things God has prepared for those who love him. 
And when we did our study on heaven, uh, the playlist on heaven is uh, 50 hours in heaven because the, the playlist is actually 50 hours long. It took us 50 hours of discussion uh, to study the subject of heaven. There's there's so much to it. And and if I asked most people to, to hey, tell me what you know about heaven uh, and teach on heaven, <laughs> it'd probably last maybe five minutes, if that, because it's it's a neglected subject. But when you really studied it in, uh, in great depth, it's, it's, a, it's the most joyful thing you'll ever do. The happiest time I think I've, I've ever had in my study was studying heaven and knowing uh, what what God has prepared for us, what, he, what we have to look forward to. So I would say to live as Christ, but to die as gain, uh, yeah, it, it's even better. Uh, and as much as you may be blessed in this life, it, it's going to be even far better to leave this world and to be with the Lord in eternity because of how wonderful that will be. Um, all right. Uh, any more, uh, Renee or Ben, on that verse? Well, it occurred to me that he says, it's interesting, he says, for to me to live is Christ. So it was something that, um, it, it, again, it's not necessarily true for every believer. I mean, it, 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 it should be true for every believer, but it's not necessarily true for every believer. Not every believer sees it that way. And so I think it's very important that we have our right perspective. Um, for, so, for example, in even um, cause we, we are, you know, we, we are going to suffer one way or another. Um, you're either going to suffer for evil or you're going to suffer for good. Uh, as you know, so even 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 again, if you're indulging in sin, whether you might think that's pleasurable, uh, you know, a short term pleasure, the long term, you're going to be suffering for it. Um, and, and that's why I think, again, where. uh well, so parallel is in First Peter four fifteen and sixteen. He says, "But let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or as or as a busybody in other people's matters." So those, that's suffering for evil. That's something that could happen. Um, yet in, in verse sixteen, he says, "Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter." Um, so again, it's it's a perspective that I think we should all be equipped with. Amen. And I, I use that verse too to prove that ridiculous. If you're really saved, you wouldn't do that. Okay. It's clear Christians can murder. Look at right. David. You know, uh, we're not promoting it. It's just to say it's not possible is to deny that we have two natures. Right. You know, so uh, that, that was important. Uh, one of y'all brought up saved through childbearing. That's a really good way of explaining, you know, salvation or being saved used. And it was Ben, I believe. And uh, I, I did a video on that. And I'm not sure. I, I think it's possible what I believed of it. But now uh, hearing this, I, I think it might also be referring to uh, how God cursed women to, through painful childbearing. Uh, I think that Paul is uh, saying, that's not how God sees them. God does not hate women. God loves them. They'll be saved through childbearing. This this whole experience of childbirth is a temporary, temporal situation that they are one in Christ and God loves them no less than men. I, I really do believe some of these things in Timothy were questions being brought up to him and he was repeating, not that he believed them because they're, they're opposite a lot of what he actually taught and believed. So I think if we put quotations on some of it as him answering from others, uh, it makes a lot more sense. Um, so the saved through that is being delivered or uh, that's not your final situation. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, um, there, I see some footnotes in the NABRE I want to read, but um, let me uh, just remember the, when you commented about um, – absent from the body and present with the Lord and uh, the how the soul sleep uh, teachers um, interpret that. Um, I, I was uh, I did a, a series titled um, What is the State of the Dead? And I, primarily it was talking about uh, the in, the intermediate state and then and the, uh, the the eternal state. The intermediate state is if we die, how do we exist? Uh, be, before the resurrection, between our death and the resurrection, 
and then the resurrection off into eternity, what is our state of existence? And in eternity, my conclusion is that the lost perish. They suffer the second death and perish. But in the intermediate state, uh, do we have a conscious existence or is it an unconscious existence where you're unaware or, or uh, what they call soul sleep? So this, we had a someone teaching that series with me that he not only agreed with me that the lost perish, but he actually did believe in soul sleep. So we, we had a disagreement on that. I certainly believe soul sleep is wrong. But the way that they interpret that, Renee, is um, absent, uh, absent from the body and, and present with the Lord as far as you know. That's how they yeah, you wake up and you don't know how many years have passed. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, well, Moses and Elijah were clearly standing there with Jesus. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's to me, that, that's, 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 that's enough. That settles it. Yeah, that I mean, and the the dead walked around Jerusalem resurrected after yeah. Jesus was resurrected. There's a you know, there's a lot of verses, a lot of uh, scripture that refutes the idea of soul sleep. I watched the series I did. What is the state of the dead to to get a, a more complete uh, teaching on? But the Bible clearly, clearly, is easy to refute soul sleep. If you, yeah, I, I agree. And uh, even though we believe the lost perish. And it doesn't tell us exactly what Hades looks like for the wicked. I don't need to know that. The intermediary state before they're destroyed. I don't need to know if they're there. I don't need to know if they're uh, immediately. Uh, they have to be resurrected to be destroyed in the lake of fire. That's what the Bible says. Risen to condemnation. So I don't know what happens to them in between because I'm not lost. I don't need to know. I want everybody to have the hope we have that when they step out of this mortal coil, they go on to be with the Lord. Mm -hmm. And I think he is the minute. I mean, the second you're out of here, you are present with the Lord. I really do believe that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And then, of course, then there's the people that talk about how they died and then they were resuscitated or, you know, and uh, maybe they were dead for a Period, a period of time and then brought back but th to me you're not dead unless if you can't come back like that you didn't really die die means you're not coming back <laughs> until the resurrection um let me look at these uh this footnote here in the nabre verses 19 through 25 it and uh, this it says um paul earnestly debates his prospects of martyrdom or continued missionary labor while he may long to depart this life and thus be with Christ, his overall and final expectation is that he will be delivered from this imprisonment and continue in the service of the Philippians and of others. And there are verses uh, that I guess we're coming to that make them come to that conclusion. Um, in either case, Christ is central. Uh, if, if to live means Christ for Paul, Death means to be united with Christ in a deeper sense. Okay. All right. Uh, any more? Shall we go to, go to the next verse? With regards to soul sleep, um, I, I think the verses that suggest like there's sleep, I think it, that it, it's sleep in, in the sense that it's from the perspective of, the, of the, the land of the living, those fellow believers are sleeping. But from God's perspective and from that uh, that 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 believer who has passed on, they that they're not sleeping. You know, they're they're with Christ. But from the, if, I think it's from the perspective of the you know fellow believers. Yeah, we can say they're sleeping. You know, uh, yeah, yeah. But yet, I think the people that believe in soul sleep will say no. From God's perspective, from everyone's perspective, they are sleeping until they're resurrected. And I think you guys uh, are are correct that that's that's false. Well, sleep is just a metaphor because Jesus said we'll never perish. Right. Sleep is a metaphor for death for Christians because he said we will never die. So if we say a Christian died, we're, we're saying that Jesus is wrong. So the, the Christians just say sleep because there is no death for us. There is none. You know, and, and people take these things to be um, literal in, in the sense that they're actually asleep and unconscious. And that, that's, you cannot apply 
that to it. You have to go by what the Bible, why is the Bible using the word sleep? Is, is he using the word sleep for us to think that people are just unconscious somewhere? Or is he using the word sleep because he said a Christian will never die? And so also a way in the Old Testament to say like he went to sleep with his fathers. He joined his ancestors. He was just buried with his ancestors, you know, because they, they believed in a resurrection. So I, I, uh, it is a very, very flimsy. Ironically, I believe the gentleman I'm having on on the 14th believes mm -hmm. in sleep. He does, doesn't he? Yes, he and, does. and that's okay with me um, because I don't really care about the intermediary state of the lost where they go. And if he disagrees with me about being absent from the body and present with the Lord, I can live with that. My, I want his expertise on the evolution of eternal torment becoming a doctrine. Yeah. Yeah. I'm really looking forward to that. Um, the, hmm. Now when you change that subject to Chris date, I for, forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> uh, oh, sorry. Uh, You're talking about oh, yeah, uh, uh, sleep. Well, why this word sleep? I, I I suspect that the Bible uses the word sleep uh, be, because um, uh, it when a person dies, if, if if someone was let's say you walk in the room and they're laying on their bed and they're dead, uh, until you really examine them, you look at them, it just looks like they're sleeping. So it, it it's it just uh, uh, as you said, what is the word where um an alleg allegory what was the word you used uh metaphor a metaphor it's a metaphor that's all it really is because when a dead body unless it's you know mutilated and you know all stabbed or shot up and bloody if a person just dies uh, peacefully in their sleep you look at it, I mean, it it would look like they're just sleeping it, so i think that's why the, the word sleep is is, be, is being used um okay let me see uh what verse are we on? 20, uh, 22. Renee, would you read that one and comment on it first? Yeah. Uh, but if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I wot not. Uh, he's saying he doesn't know what he would choose. If, if he were to um, uh, go on living physically, in the flesh or to die for Christ. He, he doesn't even know if he'd choose it, it which one he'd choose. I think he's saying, I, I can't decide. I what not. He, yeah. he, he wouldn't, he wouldn't be able to answer that. I'm glad you translate that for me. Cause I want not understand. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, okay. Any more on that, Renee? Or, uh, shall we give Ben a turn? Or yeah, yeah, not without going too far in the ahead. Yeah. That's okay. Go, go ahead, Ben. What do you say? Yeah, I have very little to say without going farther ahead. But yeah, it, it, it just. I think again, he's he's torn between the idea of being with Christ, uh, which is very desirous, but um, he also knows that if he if he stays here and lives in the flesh. Uh, it will be an opportunity to gain rewards and to um, and to advance the cause of Christ. So, like I said, it's a win-win. Actually, it's a win-win-win. It's a win. It's a it's a win for him. It's a win for Christ. It's a win for uh, fellow believers. So, um, again, Satan loses, Christ wins. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yay! Mm -hmm. So I. I'm I'm a little bit jealous of you, Sister Renee. Uh, you, you just nothing seems to stump you in the KJV. Uh, I, I was talking to Merle on the phone the other day. We were talking about KJV and this question about Bible translations, and, and um, he says that he he understands the KJV better than modern English. And I, I mean, some people, I guess, are really really comfortable with with that. That's all I've ever known. You know, it, it's it's all I've ever known. So, well, I've read it uh, many times in the KJV, and as I, as you, most people know now, I, I still read in the KJV first, but I certainly don't want to be limited because 
sometimes I have a verse like this. I say, what not? What's that mean? I don't know. It's not my native tongue, though I don't speak like that. So I like to look at other translations that can be helpful. And I'm going to do it right now. And I think we're free to do that. Uh, so in the Amplified, it says, um, uh, if, however, it is to be life here, and I am to go on living, this will mean useful and productive service for me. So I do not know which to choose uh, if I am given that choice. So, yeah, it's uh, exactly the way you uh, you said it. He, he, if, if given the choice, what do you want to do, Paul? Would you like to continue living and, and serving the Lord? Or would you prefer to die and be with the Lord right now? He says, if given the choice, I'm not sure what I would choose. Uh, but as I said earlier in my last comment, really, there's really, is there really a choice? Uh, I mean, I would much prefer to be with the Lord in, come on, in, in heaven? I mean, you can't even imagine how wonderful it is, the scriptures say. So to me, the choice is obvious. I'd rather be with the Lord. But I think as long as we are here, we should be content to know that, hey, I can continue serving the Lord, um, having fellowship with, with other believers, and, and doing the best I can. Because this world is, is the good things in this world, I, I don't want to make people think I'm completely cynical, uh, because I, I am happy uh, with my life and my, my friendships, my family, and there's a lot of things about this life that I really love. But... I, when I contrast that to being with the Lord, there's no no comparison. The choice is, seems obvious to me. Not that I'm going to, uh, you know, hasten it. I'm not going to do anything to hasten it. But uh, to, to certainly seems better to be with the Lord. Matter of fact, he did does say it. He says, "Is to die is gain." Isn't gain better? Doesn't it mean when it says to die is gain? Doesn't that mean that to dying is actually better? Um. Okay. Any more on that verse? Or we go on? Uh, no. But I, when you said dying is actually better, I'm not sure he's saying. I guess he is kind of saying it would be better because it is gain. But I, I think he's actually saying e both are equally good. That if he were to survive it and continue to serve the Lord and live in the flesh. Or to die, but to die is gain because you're 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 actually in the presence of the Lord. So maybe so. Yeah, but I mean, as much as as much as you can desire to be with the Lord and uh, see see heaven, and, and uh, we know we know some things, and it, it's exciting the things that the scriptures tell us about it. But, I mean, that just scratches the surface of, of what we have to look forward to. Uh, so knowing that, uh, yeah, it'd be wonderful. But uh, uh, as long as we are going to be here, uh, we have the opportunity to serve. Uh, not only is it a, a joy to serve, like what we're doing right now is ministry. It's serving the Lord and, and serving the body and uh of trying to help other believers, uh, but uh, it, it's a wonderful thing. Uh, and, and so we have an opportunity to do this and we will be earning rewards. I mean, that's another thing. Bible Jim, when I first met him and started preaching, he asked me, what's, why are you here? Uh, are you here to, uh, because uh, you want to please the Lord or are, here, are you here because you care about the lost? Or are you here to earn rewards? And I've never been given that question before. I don't really, hadn't really thought about it. But my first thought was uh, really all of them. I mean, I want to, I'm doing it because the Lord wants me to do it. And I want to do what the Lord wants. Uh, and I do care about the loss. The rewards, yeah. Jesus said to build up your treasures in heaven. Uh, Paul talks about it. So, so both Jesus and Paul agree that it, it is not something to be frowned upon like oh they're just in it for the reward they're just trying to get you know get some rewards but um that's not there's nothing wrong with having that as a motivation but it's not my main motivation it's probably third on my list <laughs> all right you guys want to see next verse 
All right. You want me to read the next one and he can answer it? What's that? You want me to read the next verse in KJV and he answers it or what? Yeah, that'll be fine. Okay. Go ahead. All right. For I am in a strait betwixt the two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. So you're right, Brother Luke. It was better. There's that word betwixt again. <laughs> um, so, yes, uh, in, the new, in the New King James, again, just sometimes I like to compare it with that. So uh, it says, for I'm hard pressed between the two, having a desire to, par to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Um, yes, um, I think it, it sounds almost selfish. You know, it, I, I know it's not, but it's almost sounds selfish. Like we're saying, OK, I'd rather be with Christ. But he says, um, well, he says, I'll, I guess I'll stop there. But um it's you know he has a choice uh it, it, it actually it looks like he was before before the sentence he was kind of vacillating or waffling between the two options and now here in tw verse 23 it sounds like he settled kind of that kind of conclusion you know if he was hard pressed or if he if he had to choose between the two he would uh choose to be with the lord um but um it, it, so that uh, you know that that would like you said like you said luke that's like all your suffering, all your hardship in this life is over. You can you can finally rest. Uh, you know you, you you can fully you have truly entered that rest. Uh, you know from an eternal perspective, and uh, who doesn't want that? <laughs> kind of hard I, without going. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it's hard to go without going forward. So I, I'm only going to mention one word out of this. Yeah. Uh, why don't you read 24 and let him content a comment on okay. that? We really go together. That'll, that'll be good. I will. Um, can I say the word straight real quick? The word straight sure. here. Yeah. Go, go ahead and then we'll. we'll S-P-R-A-I-T. A lot of people have a false teaching propped up on not understanding the word straight is actually a synonym for narrow. It is not straight as in uncrooked. And so, like, we got to walk the straight and narrow. Okay, it's saying I got to walk the narrow, narrow. The the whole point of Jesus uh, saying that uh, narrow is the way and straight is the gate is because it's him. And it's very narrow because there's only one way. And that's Jesus. Uh, straight is not uncrooked. Like, it's some path you're walking uh, that the righteous you know what i mean like people think it's their own righteousness that's saving them the straight and narrow path when the straight and narrow path is jesus christ you're in him he already walked the path for you and you get in because of him because he is the door to the sheepfold but the word straight here is uh not uncrooked it's not spelled g-h-t s-t-r-a-i-g-h-t would be uncrooked but straight as in it's narrow. I'm in a, like, like Ben said, hard pressed. I mean, it's a narrow race here for me between the two. So I just wanted to use that verse to explain the word straight is not uncrooked. It's, mm -hmm. it's narrow. It's just another sin. And that's why he uses the word wide and broad the same way. They're both synonyms, you know, mm -hmm. Um, it's just the way he spoke. So, and uh, 24, Ben, so you can continue your thought. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. So go ahead and continue your thought. Now you can, without going. Well, yeah. Uh, again, I, I think Paul, again, is always in, in, is thinking selflessly where he's thinking, well, you know, he, he is the, is, is the apostle to the Gentiles. And he is, he established the church essentially and it, with the Gentiles. And so he knows it's, it, it, it's, it's in the early days yet. And I, he hadn't even written all his epistles yet. So I think he, he's understanding that um, it's, it's more, it, God has him, uh, hasn't taken him home yet. And has allowed him to experience the consequences or the circumstances rather that, that he's currently experiencing. Uh, not, not because God doesn't care or is not involved, but the just the opposite. He is very much involved and very much has a design in plan, and it's for, uh, it's for his church. Uh, yes, Paul will will receive uh, re rewards, um, but uh, ultimately it's for the betterment and the 
uh, advantage of others, other believers. So uh, I, I, Paul has that in mind, as as we all should have that in mind. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Uh, Renee, you want, you want to continue the thought on uh, the next verse? Yeah, yeah, then, sure. and I'll, I'll talk last on that. Sure. Uh, so... Never when he says, uh, I'm going to straight betwixt the two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Uh, so nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. So he's saying, uh, uh, it would be better for the congregation if Paul stayed here because he could be there to help them. Uh, but for himself, he of course would rather be with Jesus. But his obligation and love for the congregation is what gives him pause. I think this is a way of Paul expressing his love for the congregation. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, the uh, when you talked about the word straight, uh, I'm glad you elaborated on that and, and uh, defined it better. But uh, I think we could replace the word straight with the word pickle, for I am in a pickle. Now, uh, uh, most people think of a pickle as being, I'm in a problematic state here. And there's a problem here. It's a pickle. Uh, but I think of a pickle as um, I played Little League Baseball when I was a kid. And um, I remember we had a, a, a term called, if you get in the pickle, that means that you're, you're stuck between two bases and they're trying to tag you and get you out and they're throwing it back. When you're in between, you, don't, you have to decide which way to go. And uh, it's kind of a fun thing and we used to drill it all the time. But so I'm in a pickle between the two. I'm not, I'm not undecided which way to go with this. Uh, and, but then in verse 24, what that? Tight, like when I said narrow, it can mean tight. So like stuck between the two i mean yeah. a straight a tightness of a narrowness a tightness so you're right a pickle that'd be right well I, I didn't think i'd ever be talking about using the word pickle uh in the bible but uh I, that's i think that does make sense uh, verse 24 of course it gives us his his uh, uh uh, conclusion is is that really his, his thoughts are not so much about what's better for him but what's better for the church, the 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 the, the, the brethren, and uh, you know, he, he says, nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. So again, Paul puts his own desires and needs second or last, and and the the, the needs for the the church first. Um, you know, he also volunteered to lose his salvation so that the. Israel could be saved if, you know, uh, so it kind of a, a, an illustration or a picture of what Christ did, you know, sacrifice yourself so that others could be have salvation. Um, let me read those two verses in the Amplified, and then we'll have to be fin finish up. I can't believe how I looked at the clock uh, and time has really flown by. So the Amplified 23 and 24 says, but I am hard pressed between the two. I have the desire to leave this world and be with Christ, for that is far, far better. Yet to remain in my body is more necessary and essential for your sake. So I think that really expresses it uh, exactly right. Um, wow. Um, did, do you feel the same way? And did this time fly by especially fast tonight? Yeah, I want to say, because I know I'll forget next week, Paul's words are so strong in this letter. I, I, I believe he had a supernatural revelation that ultimately he would be freed because I believe he knows that God would prepare him if he were to die. Like, because I, I see later, you know, uh, in his other letters when he knows it's coming. Uh, I think he's prepared for it now, but I think he is, his wording is so confident and so, you know, I, I I really think that he, in his spirit, knew that he would not die this time. Just just his wording. So next week when we discuss it, take, just, you know, take a look at how strong his words are. 
in that regard. Yeah. Um, it did. I, I, I've said this many, many times, uh, but I really believe, uh, obviously, Christ dying for our sins uh, was yeah, absolutely uh, not only necessary, but um, that's something we have to always be mindful that we're thankful for his sacrifice, his great love that he would die for us. But really, that resurrection, that bodily resurrection uh, is really what, you know, we've talked about that verse that we're justified by his resurrection. Um, I, I, I interpret that to mean that why, uh, someone could say, well, why should I believe that? I mean, uh, it will give me some reason why, why believing that is justified. And I would say, well, the resurrection, your faith is justified because of the resurrection. That, will get, that gave us the proof. After all, that turned the apostles from cowards into bold preachers to, to uh, you know, preach at the cost of their lives. And Paul's another example. Paul, Paul saw an, the risen Christ. I believe Christ taught Paul for at least a 14-year period. Uh, he was uh, kind of delayed. And, and then before he went on his missions, uh, and I believe Paul was taught directly by Christ. And, and we, we, if you get to see the risen Christ in that way, then you can have this, the kind of confidence that the apostles had and, and, and the, the original apostles and then the apostle Paul. And the, knowing that because of the resurrection, they had that kind of confidence, that gives me that kind of confidence that, hey, what? If you're ever having any doubts of your salvation or that the Bible's true and that there's really a death, burial, and resurrection, he is risen and he promised to raise us to eternal life. If you ever have any doubts about that, the uh, the resurrection and, and the t testimony of Paul and the others uh, should give you this confidence that your faith is justified. I agree with your interpretation of that verse too when it says risen again for our justification. You know, uh, not just that we're justified in the eyes of God because of his sacrifice, but our our faith is justified in him by his resurrection, risen again for our justification. I, I agree with you on, on that interpretation, Brother Luke. I'm very happy to hear that. I didn't know if anybody agreed with me on that. I've said yeah. it so, so many times, but... I'm glad to hear that you think it's correct. But uh, all right, uh, that, that'll be it for the scriptures tonight. So let's take some time now to kind of sum up our thoughts on, on the study. Uh, ben, you want to go first? Sure. Uh, I, I agree with you. Uh, it went by super fast. In fact, I felt like we were just getting started. Um, but one thing you said about that, you brought up the verse. Uh, this is no big deal. I, I, don't, I don't have any problem with your interpretation. But I, I don't think when you said the... Uh, the Paul wished himself eternally condemned for the sake of his brethren. I don't think that's actually what he was saying. I think if you look at the context, just the just this is interesting is all. Uh, he used the word anathema, and again, uh, he, he says in Galatians, for example, if he or an angel from heaven comes with you another another gospel, let him be anathema. Well, we know an angel from heaven, uh, and a, an apostle can't be eternally condemned. It just means to be set aside, like not part of your, it's not part of your program. And I think the context of that, of that in Romans is basically saying, well, one of the step things that Paul establishes in Romans is that he, as an apostle, has been set aside for the Gentiles and that and that God has not set aside Israel, um, but that they have been hardened in part um, so that the gospel could go forth to the Gentiles, again, for which Paul has been set aside. And, uh, and and it will continue until the fullness of the Gentiles, and then God is going to return to um, Israel. And so, again, he used the word anathema, which essentially means set aside. So I think what Paul's saying there, and by the way, Paul said he he not he said, I, I wish myself could be uh, cut off from Christ or set aside from Christ. It, it's the word anathema. Well, the word wish there is actually pray. He was actually praying to God. I don't think Paul would ever pray to God, I want to be eternally condemned. So I think what he's basically saying is that he, he was praying to God, God, let my ministry, let my being set aside for the Gentiles be over, and I want you to return to my brethren. That I want you to return uh, and work, to work through 
Israel again. So let my ministry be over. Let the fullness of the Gentiles be fulfilled and return to Israel. I think that's what he was saying. Uh, not a big deal either way. I just think it's interesting because, again, I, I I came across I, that. Go ahead. I, I, could, I, I can stand on that. However, I think Paul is being figurative, saying I would be cursed so my nation would be blessed. I, I think it's just figurative language to say because anathema can also mean cursed. Um, and it could be temporal. You know, yeah. it doesn't it doesn't have to mean eternally cursed. It just means it could be temporal. And I, I think he was saying he'd be willing to be cursed so his nation could be blessed. Uh, well, I don't know if we can know uh, if Paul actually was willing. Love. I think it's strong figurative language to show his love for the nation. Yeah, I, I think it, you're probably right that it's figurative, but I don't really think we can know if Paul was actually willing to give up his own salvation so that the nation of Israel could be saved or not. It's likely it's figurative, but he also, he, I think you have another uh, example of Paul uh, being uh, giving us an, uh, using himself as a picture of Christ in the, the the letter to Philemon. That's really what it is: is that Paul Paul says, "I will pay his his bill." Uh, Paul will you know take the the the, the cost for uh, the sl the slave that ran away. He would pay his bill. He'd be completely responsible. And and I think when if we get to the book of Philemon eventually, that you'll see that that's a beautiful picture of. Uh, uh, what Christ did, Paul is 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 uh, saying that he's he's giving us the same kind of a thing. But I don't know, Ben. I don't know. Well, I, 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 yeah, it's not your, a big view, deal. your view is your view is unique as far as I know. I yep. don't know if anybody else. And uh, you always have to be careful with unique unique ideas. Oh yeah. well, I, okay. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. I, I find it very difficult that Paul would actually pray to God that he'd be condemned. Why would he pray for something he knew he that couldn't be that God couldn't do? He couldn't condemn him. So again, just uh, interesting, uh, something to think about. Uh, but other than that, I had a great time this evening, and if, again, it felt like it was just getting started. So I'm looking forward to next week. Yeah, uh, I want to say I, it can mean that, and I have no problem um, with that interpretation. Um, I do, however, believe it's a little bit stronger than that, but it doesn't mean eternally cursed. It doesn't mean eternally condemned. Uh, I think it's a strong, figurative, uh, speaking against false gospel preachers. Like when he says, if they preach another gospel, let them be accursed, is what it says in the you know King James, anathema. And you say set aside. Yes, I, I agree with that. But I also believe the accursed language is there for a strong uh, figurative um, to show how displeasing and how wrong it is um, and unacceptable. And so the accursed there, I do not believe would necessarily be eternally accursed, but um, set apart, like you said, temporally cursed. That's that's how I've interpreted that uh, in the past, that it doesn't have to necessarily be that. But I do believe the language is strong for a, a reason to show how uh, horrific it is. Yeah, well, uh, you know, tradition and uh, the majority view on theology, uh, it, it's not always right. And the best example to make this point is, is that the vast majority of Christendom does not believe that uh, it's faith alone. They believe it's faith and works. Look at almost all the various sects of Christendom, uh, Roman Catholicism being the largest and it's faith plus works. So just because there's a traditional view or there's a majority view, we shouldn't automatically fall into lockstep with it. Uh, but on the other hand, I think we should be very slow to depart from the majority or the traditional view and be very, very careful to, to embrace any, let's say, unusual or unique or new new ways of interpreting things. But I want to hear because, hey, maybe maybe uh, that is the right, right thing. But I always ask myself, um, have theologians throughout the last couple of thousand years uh, in all their writings and, and debates uh, 
have they ever come up with this idea or 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 uh, is the idea that that is being espoused is this completely new and unique and then i would say well why is it that no other great theological minds have ever taught that so i i think that's a, a very important thing to keep in mind if if you hear people coming up with anything that's absolutely different than you've ever heard before um all right, Renee, why don't you give us your uh, your summary or your thoughts on the discussion tonight? Well, I, I like the, the context of tonight's discussion because I see so many Christians in utter fear and torment right now. I mean, I get text all day long, just everybody in a panic over this conspiracy or that conspiracy. And I'm like, wow. So when we see Paul handling what... Christians that would have to deal with this would be shaken in their boots. And he deals with it with such gratitude and joy and peace. And when, when, like he said, to live is Christ and die is gain. When, it, when it's really Christ living in us, it's, it, it's not really stuff being done to us. It's all to him. And, and we can endure all things. Or he says, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. So um, we like these little coffee cup verses, you know, but we rarely live them. We rarely uh, actually take them to heart and put them into application as Christians. And I, I think it's important to remind ourselves what these guys went through and with the, the grace they endured it. And uh, I really love this chapter. I'm happy to see. You. Oh, and happy new year, you guys. And uh, Jim's birthday is tomorrow, so I won't be around until the day after. So happy new year to you. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, yeah. Well, next time we see everybody get together, it'll be next year. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, the, the discussion tonight, the study was uh, great. It, uh, these particular scriptures are, you know, we've got some wonderful uh, thoughts being conveyed. They give us great uh, hope and confidence uh, uh, in our promise of eternal life. And so it, it was a wonderful discussion. Um, Renee, uh, remind everybody again of, of what's coming up uh, uh, next, next, is it next Thursday and then the following Thursday? Yes, sir. January 7th. And January 14th are the two live streams that have scheduled Thursday nights, 9 p.m. Yeah. Okay. I uh, thought there was something else I wanted to say, but I don't remember. So, uh, all right. So, uh, let me just tell the congregation it seemed like uh, the chat room uh, uh, functioned wonderfully tonight. I'm glad to see that. Thank you, everybody, for participating. And uh, Ben and Renee, as usual, it was wonderful studying the scriptures with you. So thank you to everybody. We'll see you all next year. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus.